Thank you, Adam. So this is the year of the Olympics. This is a relay. So Adam has passed the baton. I have it here. And so what we want to do is we're going to take the implications of those ensembles, as we're called, 400 um, runs um, of the IGSM leads to 6,800 um, 50 year sequences we have to run. And so that, ha that requires a, a large team, and this is a, a number of them are in the room here, and the, we can um, go forward and talk about that. So what we used to do, what I wanna talk about is bash myself. Um, this is what was done for the World Bank in looking at multi-sector investment opportunities in the Zambezi River, and using the classic IPCC techniques, all we're able to do is look at the extreme event or the extreme cases um, or the worst case scenario. So we would look at what is the wet of all the IPCC GCMs, what is the wet one and what is the dry one. And you can look here and see as Adam showed, this is the only information we're providing to decision makers. And in some, they're on both sides of the, both signs. Here, there is very little change. And so what policymakers come back and they say, what is the likelihood of that? If that's the extreme, do I respond to that? They, they do not like this. We, we can do it mathematically, it's really nice and easy to do, but this is the classic approach. And we want to go beyond that to give some more information so we can make um, investment decisions. So as we look at these various things, these shortcomings, when we make decisions on hydropower roads, agriculture, we are doing a risk-based approach currently. We use something called design storms, the return period of one in 10 year, one in, one in 100 year for flooding. We make those decisions with risks in mind. Um, what are those things saying to risk? We're not able to address that. So what has happened is the team um, developed by Wider, um, the external director, uh, Channing Arndt, brought us together and we have this framework which is to look at things analytically. So what Adam pointed out was this box right here. What I'm going to talk about now is what goes on in the dashed box and then Channing's going to talk about what comes out of that and what leads to that. So we take these things of temperature and precip and fossil fuel prices, but we have to take them both in terms of monthly values. Adam showed seasonal. We look at monthly values here and we take those monthly values in temperature and precip together and we look at how they'll influence um, stream flows, how that would then be looking at flooding in particular. We'll look at that in a minute. How these temperatures and precip affect agriculture in terms of irrigation demands and rain fed yields. How they affect energy in terms of hydropower as they come into runoff and then come here. Also the evaporation from reservoirs. And then how these floods and these precips together will impact roads and the pavements from, pre from rainfall and then flooding from our streams and bringing that all together and putting it into there. So that's why I'm here because I am the translator. I have a degree in, in engineering, but I also spent time and got a degree in economics, and that's why I sit between them as well. <laughs> so I'm hoping I'm not gonna drop the baton right now. We're gonna go through, and all that we can talk about these details. So this is what Adam talked about. And so you can get a picture, here's the Zambezi Basin, and in the Zambezi Basin, we have this western part and the eastern part. And these are some examples that remind you of what, what Adam just talked about. And here is the case of precipitation distribution between two scenarios. So what does it mean for the runoff in the Zambezi? What is the flow that's in that river? And this is for the West Zambezi, this part from Zambia, parts of Angola, and, and a little bit of Zimbabwe, a culminating that would be entering the um, Kariba Reservoir, as well as the, the development on the Kafue that the, Zamb the Zambia has looked at. And this is a case where the difference between the unconstrained and the 450, or, or that's the level one stabilization, is not much difference in the mean impacts. The modes are about, I mean, the modes are about the same. But the important thing is look at what happens at the tails. There's a significant shift in the extremes between the um, unconstrained or no, no policy, and not so much on the lower end, but we're seeing less likelihood of, of drying, but an increase, de much more decrease in, in a wetting. We go ahead here and look on the eastern Zambezi, and here we see an interesting thing. We see a shift 
um, almost the exact same distribution, but a shift over of the mode. So we're having a mean shift to the drier side and a decrease in this flooding, but also a decrease in the lower end. So basically we're shifting the distribution. So this is really important. The Zambezi is not a unified body. It's not homogeneous. It's changing, we're, here, we're seeing right here, between east and west, and it even changes by basin by basin. So now if we look at this at flooding for the West Zambezi, look at this. Again, the modes stay the same, but a big reduction um, in the, the tail. So what does that mean? Well, that's really important when we look at flooding impacts on road infrastructure. And one of the things that people tend to think about climate change and water resources, it's droughts. We're worried about droughts and lower flow. Um, we are seeing in our research and uh, hopefully to document in our next, our next uh, special issue, it's flooding that is most da damaging and Channing will talk about that because it destroys infrastructure. So not only do you lose economic activity that year, you have to take money that you're going to use to develop your economy to repair the past. So it has a double impact on you. So we have these flooding, and so we use this approach developed by Professor Chanowski to look at the, um, the impact on the road infrastructure, which goes directly into the economic model. We then say, all right, what's going on in terms of the, the river? We're going to look at the, Zambi, the, the river in Zimbabwe and the river in uh, Zambia. And we see between the unconstrained and level one distribution, the runoffs, again, the cutting down of the higher flows. In both cases, we're seeing this behavior. So you can see the country here. Here's uh, Zambia. Here's Zimbabwe. And we're going to talk in a minute about Mozambique. And the thing about Mozambique, only a small part of it um, is part of the Zambezi Basin, but it's very large Kaborabasa hydropower plant, very important to the energy um, infrastructure of Mozambique. But the other thing, it's downstream of everybody else. So if they're gonna adapt to climate change, are they gonna think about what they're gonna do to Mozambique? That's another issue. So again, we see this probabilistically. The next thing is what happens to irrigation demand, which is a combination of temperature and precip. Precip goes up, we don't need so much, but if it gets warmer, we need more. And what we see is a increase in the demand for irrigation in Mozambique under the unconstrained emission. And if we have the level one stabilization, we see a big shift back to almost a, maybe five millimeters um, per year. And so a big shift of the mean back this way and we lose this tail again. So we're seeing this behavior in the stabilization is bringing the, the PDFs in. So this is water resource systems. This is a model of the Zambezi Basin and Alyssa McCluskey, will you raise your hand, please? This was done by Alyssa, um, who's part of our team um, at the Institute for Climate and Civil Systems. And this is using a tool where we model all these components and all their interaction, because it matters what you do here on what happens here and what you do here. So this is classic water systems. We now take all these probabilistic funds through that and produce the impacts in 2050 on hydropower development. And so you can see right here, here in Zambezi, the, in the unconstrained emissions, we have uh, distribution around zero with a little bit of a table here, but with the level one, we see almost no negative impacts on hydropower and it's positive impacts on hydropower. While we look in Zambia, and both of them have a mean in the negative side, but there are some, the, the unconstrained has a little peak here and a tail in the positive. And you see that the distribution is different for each of the countries. So as we talk to policymakers, that's important. But then what we get out of this is if we look at all the hydropower together, what we see is a, a distribution that will help us look as we look at regional power pools and, and cooperation in the basin. So one of the messages from a water resource side and from a hydropower side is here is the probability distribution. We can make decisions about our reservoirs and what to do, but it also tells us if we cooperate amongst the, the riparian countries in the basin, we can go ahead and make some benefits. The other thing it tells us is we don't know what the future is going to be, so we can do some clever things in design. One of the things is you design a small dam and then you put bigger dams on top. 
or you build the dam with multiple outflows because we don't know how much water is going to come out. The High Aswan Dam has their outflow here, and if it ever drops below here, this water is not usable. We could put this in when we're building it at almost zero cost, but to do it later. Hydropower, leave it blank, and you can put it in later. So these kind of adaptations we can take on. So what we see is that there's no single answer related to water resource infrastructure. We need to make flexible design. This variability is very, very important. And as Adam pointed out, the means, you have to be careful because the means mean zero. Many times the means are zero. So if you just look at that, there's no impact. But it's these tails that affect us in design. And each of the sectors behave differently. And sometimes people say, oh, I'm going to adapt for the agriculture by irrigating. But then the hydropower people say, I'm going to adapt by building some more reservoirs. And then you find out there's no water at all. So when you do sectoral-based adaptation, it's, it's almost the null set. That may not exist. So there's a need to move to economy-wide, multi-sector approach through economy-wide models, which is what Channing will talk about, how they, all these things feed into it. Thank you. <laughs>